All right, welcome to Speakeasy Online. It's September 2023, and we're in for some more poetry and stories and japes and all sorts of shenanigans. Uh, I'm going to do a cheeky plug to begin with. I'm uh, I'm doing this. It's called Space Radio. We're at the Green Room Theatre in Carlisle on Friday night at half past seven, and it's lots of silly sci-fi stories and stories and things. things. And uh, it's it's donations, uh, tickets on the door, and they're donations. So uh, if you think it's good, give them lots of money. And if you don't think it's any good, well, yeah. there we are. Um, so yeah, that's Friday, this Friday. And there's been a series of those. I've, I've fallen in with a bad crowd over the summer doing events at uh, Megacon and uh, Dan Russell's uh, music festival, Wild on the Wall. And... Uh, all the crew from the source were coordinating this music festival over three days, which was which was wonderful until it turned into a quagmire within about half an hour of being there. And tractors were having to pull all the cars across the fields. And uh, yeah, but it couldn't dampen people's spirits. That was good fun. Uh, there's probably something else. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. Speakeasy in real life is at the source next Wednesday. That's the 27th of September. And uh, yeah, doors open at seven. And we'll kick off about half seven. If anyone's got any other messages, please tell us as we go around. And uh, yeah, we'll kick off. This is, um, well, Rishi Sunak's just been talking about um, pushing back some of his green agenda goals and bits and pieces. And this is a poem called The Sustainability Catch. Uh, and it goes uh, a bit like this. Electric cars sound pretty good. But do you have a plug lead long enough? I see it's got to be a rechargeable battery. Well, what's the catch? There always is one. This'll be a kicker. Rare earth metals. They're used in the battery and they're necessary for nearly all our technology. Thing is that they're in limited supply. Petrol is dwindling. Diesel's days are numbered. Coal isn't viable. Gas won't last forever. What's the catch? There always is one. This will be a kicker. Nuclear power is not green. It's a finite resource. So the man on the radio says, in a debate, uranium supplies will last about 90 years. Most of it is from Kazakhstan. Thorium is a replacement. So that'll be another 100 years. And then what? Oh, and by the way, it leaves a legacy of a hundred thousand years of waste. What's the catch? There always is one. This'll be a kicker. The elephant in the room, most likely, is people. We are too many, too greedy, too quick to use up more than our fair share of the planet's resources. Can't we find a smarter solution? Harness the power of the stars, sunlight, Gravity, wave, tidal, wind and rain, can they save us? It's almost as if nature is there ahead of us. But what about perpetual motion? Nikola Tesla in the zero-point energy machine, cold fusion, innovation and imagination are needed at a time of dwindling options. Is this the last roll of the dice? Is the last roll of the dice engineers with experimental contraptions? But what's the catch? There always is one. This will be a kicker. The planet doesn't care. It never did and it never will. Mother Earth would gladly wipe us from the slate, removing a warring species, perpetuating fear, greed and hate. Without human beings, this world would be a better place. There's not much to debate. Consider this. No out-of-control climate crisis. No species hunted to extinction. No forests felled. No plastics in the oceans. No sewage in rivers and seas. No smog and air pollution. No ravaged seams of minerals. No pressure to make a fast buck. No choosing between eating and heating. No poverty and wealth divide. No arguing over who is right about what happens when you die. Maybe concentrating a bit on us all being alive might be a better use of our time. What's the catch? There always is one. This will be a kicker. 
if only we were smart and put our minds to it that little bit quicker. There you are. Thanks very much. All right. Who did I say was next? Kelly. Kelly, we're with you. Right. Um, so the, the main event in my life recently has been the arrival of our first grandchild about a month ago. And um, I wrote this poem a couple of days before she was born. <clears throat> Waiting for our grandchild. We are suspended in this before time, knowing our only role is to stay near the phone. She's still safe in her cocoon, heart beating, blood pulsing, faint sounds beyond. I visualize her, head down, poised to dive into our world, breathe our air. This is my silent prayer. May peace break out. May those in power see sense. Start mending what's broken. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, I mean, what a world to come into. But I mean, what a what a joyous occasion as well. I mean, you must be uh, thrilled. Yeah, I suppose it brings it all into focus when another generation of your family arrives, you know. I mean, I was worried about everything before, but now there's a new urgency to it somehow. And it feels as though politicians just don't care about our children and grandchildren. Yeah. Even though they must have children and grandchildren themselves, you know, but they're just moral vacuums i think yeah it's got political has anyone done a time check on it it's political the first two poems have been political it's good to be back peter we're with you how are you keeping yeah oh, yeah oh, okay um fairly hectic uh in some ways uh but um little bit of imposter syndrome because I've not really been writing very much lately so I'm glad to just read some old stuff uh, but I thought it was about time I kind of got back out there again so to speak even if I'm not out there but in here <laughs> so given that we've been talking about the uh, state of the planet maybe it's maybe it's time time I, I brought out uh, this old war horse I can find the page. I hate it when poets do that. But where, where, where's the page gone? I can't. I, I don't know. I don't know. Page, page, page. <laughs> ah, there we are. Right. So that this this is this is what I wrote a very long time ago, in the mid eighties, in fact. Uh, it's date. It's you can date it by the fact that that um, betting shops were still full of smoke. So it's before the smoking ban and everything. So, back end. Another summer we must have blinked and missed as iron enters the soul of dews and trees announce their redundancies as the first leaves shuffle disconsolate in doorways. The crack swirls as thick and familiar as the leaves or betting shop smoke. A poor year, I right? need you to boot that. There's never been two our good days together. And if all agreed things aren't what, what aren't what they were, they stopped looking for reasons in June. Resignation sunk in. The old candidates for blame, say Concord and all them Russian missiles, where there's not been shem since they went to the moon, have now just about been forgotten. Some raise hope still. We had a good September last year, and it's been nice down south and all. Though really, their thoughts are edging to Spain or to Christmas. Next year could be better. Yes, there's always next year. For however clapped out, wings rusted, shot gaskets, this once good earth can seem, we cling to the thought it can be patched up, a renewal, which could keep us sane. It's as if it were drawn at the top of our slates to plot out the framework with space and time, not subsistent, but a form of percep perception. Our deep structure, 
held wide in our tales. A Persephone is released the resurrection. Barbarossa and Arthur asleep in their caves as the call comes to make their countries whole. And perhaps it's too lulling. Shops rise up neon bright from the braziers and rubble, while grass grows to shrubs and shrubs to trees in Kestrel patrolled motorway cuttings. When last year's quarries become nature reserves, finality becomes hard to credit. While we keep on hoping it will all work out or be given back somehow. With biographies too, the great man's death becomes as hard to believe in as our own. On last chapter's half thinking, he might yet be alive. If Beethoven only had better doctors, if only Wordsworth hadn't caught that chill. If only we hadn't cut the rainforest down, hadn't slaughtered all the whales. And, and it's quite seasonal as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You ticked all the boxes there, Pete. That was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow. It was amazing. You, you say that was from the, the mid-80s and you're still talking yeah. about uh, Russian missiles and things. And it's like, times don't change that much. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 nothing seems to get better, does it? Just it just slightly changes a different way of the method of delivery, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. There was a lot in there, man. That was great. Good to hear it. And good to hear you again, man. It's good to see you. It's great. Thank you. Cool. All right. We're with uh, Val now. What have you got for us, Val? Hello. Um, this is the one you missed on Wednesday. Um, it's called Back in the Political Scene. <laughs> it's called Collapsing Britain. This RAC concrete we bought is not quite as good as we thought. So we're giving you warning, there's no school in the morning. We're sorry the notice is so short. Well, Birmingham's down on its knees. Their finances have been a tight squeeze. But the council was rash and they've run out of cash and were having a big spending freeze. Lately, Britain's been under great strain, what with COVID, inflation, Ukraine. Let's save the NHS by using hospitals less until the country's recovered again. Does this really come as a surprise when MPs show up the truth with their lies? And can the spirits cope? We still have any hope? Or will the country just suddenly capsize? That was great. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, there's a Say say again, Val. No, no, carry on. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, that's brilliant. I'm sorry I missed that. Yeah, we were half an hour late to Poets Out Loud last week due to uh, everywhere in Cockneth being booked for food and food only arriving at the uh, Blocks Steakhouse at half past eight, which is when kickoff begins. So it was the quickest, quickest dinner ever. <laughs> Still made the first round, though. That was great. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, there's a, there's a political uh, strand uh, tonight. I wonder, I wonder if George will keep this this going for us. What have you got, George? No, I, I haven't. Well, I probably could if I looked a wee bit, but it's not what I brought up. Because I was going to plug, every good author should always plug his book, wow. Shake the Kaleidoscope, which the launch is on the 12th of October online in a webinar. Don't ask me what webinars are. It's Cinnamon Press has a webinar, uh, and I, along with Robin Thomas. Thomas? Gosh, I can't even remember Robin's second name. No, but so well, can't remember his second name. Anyway, we're going to launch on the 12th of October. I'm actually hoping in some stage I'll maybe make a journey down to Carlisle and make you suffer some readings from it. But <laughs> Hooray! I'm going to be in Cumbria Arts next Friday, a week tomorrow. Uh, Tom Spate is asked, well, I think he is. <laughs> he certainly said to me he wants me to do something. So we'll see. Uh, I'm an interloper down there, as you know, but I do feel <laughs> it very much at home. Anyway, what I do, thought I'd do, I just took a friend from the hospital back. I, I ran her up to the hospital, ran her home. She's got problems with her eyes. Uh, and there was, I don't know what the rain's been like down with your way, but there was suddenly these flash thunders, 
not thunder, you know, the downpours where the roads just all flooded. So what should have taken me about 25 minutes at the outside just took me over an hour. But fortunately, I know the bits where the roads flood and where it's going to be really bad. But I mean, I think some people might have been stuck for a very long time. I hope nobody te tried the, the one that's just down the road from me because every year or every time it floods, somebody tries it and ends up with a drowned car in the middle of the road, which doesn't help people coming along as well. Anyway, this is a bit about the climate. Are we there yet? And this is from year 69. These poems in the book, they don't follow chron chronologically, but I've said which year of my life they relate to. So this is year 69. Are we there yet? We pack the SUV, pull away from our house. Waters are rising. No need to check the electrics. Everything we own is smart. Rain is falling. We pass overflowing rainbow bins. We are not thoughtless discarders, but we have to be on trend of today. Waters are rising. We do not stick in mud. Our garden is hard landscape. Our artificial grass glistens like jewels. Rain is falling. The bird feeders stand forlorn. I remember thrush, blue tit, wren. No barrage, no barrage of sparrows, no singing as we leave. Waters are rising. The children watch the blue planet, ask if we saw an actual dodo. Where are all days good? Rain is falling. Is the flood a myth? Those far off islands that drowned fake news to frighten the gullible. Waters are rising. It goes in cycles, ice age, drought, flood. We survive, don't we? Rain is falling. If we had listened, if we had understood, we might know where to go. The waters are rising. George, that's very powerful, and that refrain is is so uh, impactful as well, isn't it? But no, yeah. and so, I mean, at, at the moment too, I was thinking about the thing locally. But I mean, when you just think about the terrible things in uh, Libya just mm -hmm. now, I know that it's a different kind of water rising, but it's still about flooding and it's about unusual rainfall, uh, and there's so many places, and I'm always dismayed that there's. Places in some of the small isle c countries where they're already underwater, and we just seem to ignore it. Well, the announcement today, we don't want to be ahead of the crowd. It's it's crazy, that isn't it? I mean, uh, we uh, and we pride ourselves supposedly on supposedly taking leadership on 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 things. It's ridiculous. No. Well, having come so far to make the announcements and say, you know, this is what we're definitely going to do and then backtrack on it. I just think it's, it, it's not exactly a great message, is it, to people? So, I tell you what, son, you can be a good boy, but why don't you start next week? Yeah. <laughs> it's just outrageous. It's like Kelly was saying about, you know, they don't care about the next generation or the generation after that. It's just no. what they can get out of it. But congratulations, Child Kelly. Sorry, should be a brilliant news. Yeah. Thanks, George. <laughs> and congratulations on your new collection. Um, I'll I'll try and log in for that launch. And you should you should ask Cakes and Ale. Maybe they'd let you have an evening there. Um. All right. Thanks. Yes. Yeah. In fact, Phil has good contacts there, so yeah, maybe okay. you can talk outside well, the meeting. <laughs> so many people that I know, I think I know now, don't I? Mean, you know, but I've got a lot of friends, I think, down in the area, and I, I, I think that we become very parochial sometimes as poets. I don't know if you find that. I, that I know people who are really well-known and really good poets in their own area, 
but it's fantastic. I went down to Surrey to listen to the you know John Fogan and uh, oh god, that's terrible. Anyway, I it boys down there, and I was just blown away with the standard of poetry that comes away. And I think you know sometimes we can get too linked into just the people that we know. Yeah, that's good. yeah. I can I can let you know. Uh, I can pass on Lucy's email from Cakes and Ale, George, and they're looking at getting more poets uh, and and writers. I think uh, Malcolm Carson's got an event tomorrow night actually uh, with a couple of local uh, poets and writers. Uh, I'm not sure I can make it myself because I've got rehearsals for the uh, the space radio thing. Suddenly there's a lot going on uh, locally, but uh, yeah, I mean that that will be the first of many events, I'm sure. So um, yeah, we'll make stuff happen, I'm sure. Sounds really good. Cool. All right. Well, we've we've already spun around the room once. Shall we go around again? I've got this one here. Uh, it's called In the Blink of an Eye, and it goes um goes like this. In the blink of an eye, you will be forgotten. Oh, and so will I. Just names in a book, bones in the ground, dust on the wind, lost in the layers of time. In the echoes of whispers, a fleeting memory is snagged. Unknown are your secrets or the lives that you've had. I'd take your hand if you would take mine. Damn all the rules, put them out of your mind. I'll tell you your story and you could write mine. Light the way through the dark or rekindle your spark. In the blink of an eye, you shall be gone. Oh, and so will I. You're such a beautiful girl and you light up the world. There's a sadness in your heart that won't ever let go. You'll hide those scars away, turn them into works of art. There's joy and there's madness woven in your melancholy ways. Never said the things that I should. Always thought they'd be tomorrow. Fate will play its games both with you and with me. My words devoid of all meaning. I'm deciphering these feelings. I lose myself every time you stare deep in my soul. And if in the blink of an eye, the world's blown sky high and we're all vaporized, I want you to know that I loved you so. Oh, I thought you should know. And that's that one there. Oh, thank you. Right. Kelly. Follow that. Right. I, I might lighten the tone a bit, but um, stay on, on the weather and rain theme now that we're in September and the weather has changed a bit. Um, this is one I wrote a while ago just for fun, really. Umbrellas. Similar black umbrellas are swapped every day. In cloakrooms, bars and shops, we pick them up and walk away. Impossible to tell apart, it can indeed be said. They stand in for each other, shelter any human head. But are they really passive when all is said and done? Perhaps they're only playing, having brolly fun. Transport for London's office has 35,000 lost brollies. They lie there waiting quietly on endless shelves and trolleys. When they suddenly go missing on a train, a plane or bus, is it we who have lost them or they who have lost us? That's one of those great philosophical questions, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How did you come up with that one, uh, Kelly? I mean, what prompted... I, I think it was... I did actually walk off with someone else's black umbrella by mistake. <laughs> you know, it was one of those racks where everyone had put their umbrellas and it just occurred to me, yeah, how the hell do you tell them apart? Everyone's got these black umbrellas, <laughs> but perhaps they have a secret life. And then I googled, you know, lost umbrellas. 
London transport and found there was this incredible number of lost brollies waiting there. <laughs> and sadly, they're almost disposable now, so nobody bothers to go and collect them, I suppose. There's a whole new television programme there, Kelly. I suddenly think of your long lost umbrellas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, in 1952, I was left at a bus stop and <laughs> it's <a> very far. <laughs> uh, and they're here tonight. Yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. It reminds me of the Thompson twins from the Tintin books. You know, they're, they're, they're identical detectives, aren't they, with their umbrellas and their bowler hats. And they're always going, oh, that's your umbrella. And they're like, they're the same. <laughs> How do they know? Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Kelly. Peter, what have you got for us? Well, just just one moment while I go and get my reading glasses, because I was trying to read the, the last one with my with my long distance glasses. Oh no. Not... <laughs> Can't tell glasses apart either. No. Glasses and umbrellas, they all look the same. <laughs> Everything gets harder as you get older, even being a poet. <laughs> I'm learning this. Having succumbed to the glasses wearing community. As you get older, there's nothing more, you know, you, you turn, come to reception wearing your distance glasses and say to the person, I'm sorry, I'll need to get my glasses. And you see them look at you as though they say, you daft old bugger, you're wearing your glasses, you know. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> One needs many pairs of glasses for many different situations. <laughs> oh, it's a journey I've started on. A very smart they are too, Phil. Thanks, George. Thanks. Sorry, Peter. Carry on. We're just doing yeah, our oh, glasses. That's fine. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that, that's that's better. No, I I I I had very focus for quite a long time, and I I decided at my last eye test to 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 ditch them because they um, they were neither now in summer really, with Jack of all trades and master of none. Anyway, so I'm going to continue in the autumn, and with um, one of my translations from Jules Lafogue, which is such a splendid autumn, such a splendid autumn. When autumn comes back around, this season for laments, it gives me such good ground for my artistic bent. That wind, I know it well, it is one of my own, that since my birth was knelled has given me cause to groan. Familiar with those snows, there is as if their flesh were mine, their flakes shield me from those with whose flesh I would twine. I know too as I con the sunlit autumn skies, they look so put upon, but but to give good advice. Then nothing could prevent my black dog getting loose, belief beneath fine rains that rent their solipsistic blues. Ah, autumn is all mine, and I am all, and I am autumn's friend, like all that says. But why, in this world of what then? When autumn comes back round, this season full immense. I'll have such fertile ground for my artistic bent. Thank you. Thank you. And you said that was a translation, Peter? Yes. Yeah, uh, Jules Lafargue was a big influence on T.S. Eliot. Though uh, that it was Lafargue, that was from Lafargue's kind of earlier style. It was his latest style that introduced Eliot to the idea of three verse. Mm -hmm. Cool. That's really good. And we learn things on these uh, chats. It's great. It's good. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Val, we're with you. We've got about three, three and a half minutes. So uh, over to you. Okay, I thought I'd read this one about my confusion as to why rugby's called football. Uh, if you, it's not exactly poetry, but we'll give you a laugh. <laughs> Uh, it's called Rugby is Not Football. Rugby is not proper football. For a start off, the ball is not round. They mostly pick it up and run with it and hardly ever kick it over the ground. Footballers keep the ball in play. Rugby players like to kick it into touch. 
which basically means they kick it out and the game stops and starts way too much. Footballers avoid their opponents, but rugby players don't want to stop. They run straight into the other team's players and then everyone else piles on top. Even though rugby has goalposts, they don't often try to score a goal. They'd rather have a line out or a scrum down, and then down in the mud they all roll. In football, a goal scores one point, but in rugby, a drop goal scores three. Or two points if it scores a conversion, but then three points if it's a penalty. In football, a yellow card is a warning. A red card means that player is gone. A rugby yellow card means they're sent off, but ten minutes later, they're back on. Rugby's rules are very confusing, and I don't understand them one bit. But I'm still watching the Rugby World Cup, because rugby players are really quite fit. <laughs> I've got to get it read before the time runs out. <laughs> you, did, you did very well. You're not having to be put in the sin bin at all there. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, there's a lot of differences between rugby and... and, and, and it, well, it's, it's supposed to be rugby football, but it's not football, is it? I mean, it's, it's... Not rugby football, but it's not really like football, is it? No. <laughs> and they don't even kick it very much. They mostly run with it. Oh, no. It's a funny old game, you might say. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's two different versions of rugby as well, isn't there? Yeah, that is even more confusing. Don't even stand for that. Rugby league and rugby union. I mean, what? Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well. Oh dear. The rug rugby union is becoming quite a lot more like rugby league. Have you noticed the scrums now? The scrum half's allowed to put the ball into his own player's scrum, more or less. I haven't seen a straight put in in about twenty years now. They just feed it. I didn't realise it's going to turn into a big old argument about rugby here, Val. You've opened a can of worms here, mate. And they, they were talking about somebody. Uh, the technicalities of how it was such a good turnover or something, and all it looked to me, it was like it jumped on top of him and rolled him over. So I don't know why, why that makes it a good turnover. The only turnover I know has got apple in it and it's made of pastry, so there we go. Yeah. I think we're about to have to sign back in, just use the same code and we'll log back in again in, in a second. But yeah, this is, this is interesting stuff. <laughs> Educational. And we're back in the room. Back in the room, absolutely. <laughs> have you seen Have you seen the little baby then, Kelly? Oh yes, a few mm. times. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Whereabouts are they based? Just They're in Cockermouth, so really near. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we're lucky. <laughs> so how did you get straight back in? When I when I host a meeting now and it locks me, you know, I have to come out after forty minutes. When I go to go back in immediately, it tells me I can't come back on till ten minutes have passed. Uh, I don't know, mate. I just, I just, I just started up the meeting again. So, uh, hey, I must be doing something wrong. How <laughs> long do you set the meetings for when you initially set it up, George? Because if you, if if you, thirty if... minutes. Ah, well, that might, little... be, might be where you're going wrong. Because I set this for two hours, so it allows me to dip back in. If you want to let me set, oh, I must try that. It always just says, when I did it initially, it wouldn't let me set it for longer than 30 minutes. If I, if I wasn't on professional, it wouldn't let me set it for longer than 30 minutes. Right, okay, I'll have a look at that. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right. I just, I just so is it. everybody well, Kelly? Yes, yes. Um, you know, just they're, they're very tired, the mum and oh. dad. <laughs> but but that's not surprising. Um, yeah, it was it was a bit of a roller coaster at you know the time, but yeah, all fine. Mm. And she's doing really well. Good. She's called Elena and she's growing so quickly. We can't believe it. <laughs> wow. uh, I've got to, I've now got three great is it grand? I'm not quite sure. My nephews and nieces have children. Oh, right. <laughs> the first boy, and I went round to see him the other month there, the other week there, but uh, I hadn't seen him for about, since he was about three, four months old. And when I went in the door, I thought he might be slightly strange as he crawled around the corner of the door. He just looked at me and I went, I suppose because his mother was talking to me, 
but he just did this huge wide smile and started crawling towards me. It was such a lovely oh. experience. <laughs> you, you obviously made an impression. <laughs> I was taking the chocolates and the money, I think, that did it. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, there's a few people I know have uh, had babies recently and... Uh, uh, their parents are like adjusting to uh, being grandparents and that. It's really <laughs> yeah. When was when was when was the birth? What day was she that? She was twenty uh, first of August, so she's oh. almost a month old. Yeah, oh. yeah, a, a whole new phase of our lives. <laughs> wow, it's exciting. Mm. Alrighty, I think we're all. I think we're all back. George, I think we're with you now. I think that I'm mine. There you are. Right. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, I, I can't follow on particularly from the rugby, but maybe that's just as well. But I, this this is from year fifty seven. I think it's still around, but there seemed to be a spell back then. Was it when Heston Blumenthal was about, and all the chefs seemed to be bringing bringing up these different combinations, and this just I don't know why. But hopefully the poem, Banana and Bacon Trifle. This is crazy food, a mere trifle gone bananas. Rasher mouths mix their pleasures, make a pig of themselves. Custard and bacon, like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, pretending to be a sweet concoction. Very good. Do you remember Fanny Craddock, who had that that poor assistant who always had to bring things on that she'd made earlier? Or, or Johnny, because she, she used yeah. to, you know, she just, she, she, you imagined if she had a hand in his back working on as <laughs> She was a terrifying woman. <laughs> and the food was terrifying as well. Oh. There was that program that they did. Remember, they did some program about where the two people and they 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 did so. And the person that won the event to do a, a banquet, and she was this housewife was talking to Fanny about what she was going to do, and Fanny tore into her about you can't serve this to Edward. <laughs> uh, they don't make TV like that anymore, do they? Luckily. <laughs> oh, goodness. Okay. Um, we're round again. Are we okay to go round again? Yeah, round three. Ding, ding. Um, we're getting through poems. We're, get <laughs> we're getting through poems uh, at a rate of knots here. Um, I got this one. This is this is an ode to uh, my friend's cat. I, uh, I ended up talking to girl in the bank and I was paying money in for sales at Cold You Press and she started telling me about a cat. The cat is called Goose, which is confusing. It's actually a, a double barreled name. His, name's, his full name is Marcel Goose. I wrote a poem for Marcel Goose. She's kind of funny. I, uh, anyway, this is the ode to Marcel Goose. Your little kitten is a much loved cat. You checked the small print, there's no hidden claws. A bond of joy strengthened, once scratched, twice bitten. Just the odd little bruise, forever inseparable. Perfect, of course. The one, the only, Marcel Goose. He nearly shares his name with French novelist Marcel Proust. In search of lost time, he spends all his days on the loose. Never one to pause, the ruler of the kingdom he keenly patrols, all before him subject to the laws of the one, the only, Marcel Goose. Confusing the vet is just some of the fun you get, the best little pest you must confess, wishing it was sunny rather than rainy, just one of the wishes of my friend Vinny, and of the number one feline king of the house, the one, the only, Marcel Goose. 
This little tabby makes you so happy, a little tiger, tiger with striped brown fur. Big innocent eyes lock as he pours at your hair. He, cha he chases shadows and spiders, even the occasional moose. Nothing's out of bounds for the one, the only, Marcel Goose. He likes it when you stay, but because of work you have to leave. His many adventures are too many and varied to go into here. When playtime is over, he returns with a bright flash and a swirling whoosh. Looking so innocent when you get home, the one, the only, Marcel Goose. That's the ode to Marcel Goose. Thank you. So I gave that to my friend Vinnie, and uh, she said, oh, I'll read it to the cat. And I saw the next next time I saw it, I said, did you read the poem to the cat? She said, yeah, he liked it, he liked it. She said, I'll have to get the poem framed. And then she went, well, not framed, obviously. It'll go, on. I'll just put it on the fridge, probably. I was like, oh, thanks. <laughs> High praise, indeed. <laughs> Kelly, what have you been doing? <laughs> uh I, I don't want to bring the mood down. I was going to read a sad poem, but it's nice that we're all smiling. So I'll just I'll read another slightly silly one instead. Um, <laughs> what I wish I'd said. At night, the words come trippingly, the witty reply, the sharp retort, the perfect put down. At night, I am untroubled by anxiety. I take on a part, speak clearly, decisively. The words trouble my sleep, rotating like a sushi bar, the best ones just out of reach. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, you always come up with a retort about 24 hours after it's needed, don't you? You're like, oh, I could have said that, and I would have been, I would have had the last word, but no. It's just gonna go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh yeah, that's good. Did that? Did that just come to you, or was that a workshop one? Or, or yeah, just. I I think it just came to me. Um... Yeah, I don't know whether I'd actually been dreaming about a sushi bar, but something made me think about, you know, that rotating thing when you, you keep reaching for the one you want, <laughs> but it's gone. <laughs> oh, that's such a brilliant image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, great. Thank you so much. And like a conveyor of wonderful poetry, we're with Peter again. Well, I'm, I'm well. I'm having to think on think on my feet a bit here, um, but since we've um, got into um, thinking on said feet, uh, I thought, uh, and with George going in about crazy gastronomy and get, um, get getting into the into the food thing, uh, if I can just find the right one, here, ah, here we go. One seven. There's um, eight. So, uh, I've, so I've just got my Ezra Pound out because he's got he's got a poem called La nineteen ten, and uh, which is just two lines, uh, and of course he's parodying things like. Like the fauvists who on about around about the time, so it is green arsenic smeared on an egg white cloth, crushed strawberries. Come, let us feast our eyes. So, so I wrote a riposte to this. Which is. Le Dejeuner 2010. And the lime shall lie down with the lamb, extrude to Brancusi geometries, which is chicken, and which are the eggs? Primary colours on a Mondrian plan, with Clee and Miro menageries, a spoon back blade in pasta with mousse, and a Jackson Pollock drip line of juice. 
they've got to be pulling our legs. Costing one and an arm at least, come, let us eye our feast. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. I'm not convinced about coming to either of your restaurants, though. No. <laughs> no, I, I don't do anything like that. My, my, mine, mine is all pastas and curries. Oh, well, I'm interested again. I'm interested again. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, Peter. Terrific. Thank you very much. I'll give you Thank five you. stars. That's great. Yeah, yeah. No, you can only get a maximum of three. Well, I've given you five. <laughs> That's how good it is. <laughs> Extra special. <laughs> All right. Um, Val, we're back with you. Have you got another one for us? Yeah, I have the birthday on Sunday, so um, I took this one out because uh, I was making a cake and uh, just reminded me of this poem. It's called The Birthday Cake. I thought I'd make a birthday cake. I think it was a big mistake. There's flour in my hair and cream everywhere. It's starting to be a total nightmare. I have to confess it's a bit of a mess. And how it will taste is anyone's guess. Gosh, how time flies. I'll use some sweets for disguise. Well, it looks okay. What a surprise! <laughs> and I've got any better suits, but never mind. <laughs> That's good. It's, it's 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 the cake's made with love. That's what counts. And the poem is written with love too. <laughs> good, good, good. Yes, many happy returns for. Uh... Uh, Sunday was it? Yeah, it was my sister's birthday on Sunday as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. Fantastic. It's a piece of cake writing these poems, isn't it? Thank you, George. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've missed missed these jokes. Okay, George, we're back with you. Hey, thanks. I've been searching about you, but but yeah. Uh, I'm, thinking, I'm going to take you back to the thunderstorms and downpours as I started with, uh, came out today. But this is this is this isn't from the book. This is just something which I don't think it is. I can't honestly remember what I put in there now. This was this was Hunterston, which is the power station when nuclear power was new, because this was the power station been built. It's not only been built; it's now been demolished. <laughs> So, Hunterston A from Millport, 1950s. Blue black night, oil polished sea, unearthly still broken by a thunderous downpour. In the pillared bay window on the upper floor of a Victorian villa high above the town, eating cold mince sandwiches for supper, I love the rain washed glass, clear, crisp, broken lightning slicing the horizon to light up the half-built power station. Each flash pulls me to the dark, staring through storm-plunged glass, which does not silence the howling wind, the room behind bright with electricity. I want to stand in the cleansing deluge and laugh at other sphere. The white shape of Hunterston A flickers like a B-movie monster. Was very evocative and i love the uh yeah i love the scene you conjured there george it was just like those frankenstein's monster was about to uh <laughs> be given birth because at that time we thought of the power stations is nuclear power has been the savior for everyone and then later on we probably did think it was a kind of monster that uh, was something to be feared but yeah but i does everyone remember cold mint sandwiches no Elaborate, George. We used to go to this villa, a huge villa. I was part of the Crusaders boys thing. And we went as a house party for the weekend. 
So you had mince the first night when you when you were there, mm -hmm. and then they they served you cold mince sandwiches at supper for the next three nights that you were there. And it was good for you, and you enjoyed it. You know, I, I actually quite like cold mince sandwiches, but I don't think I've ever come across anybody that has ever had them <laughs> since. Wow. It's all nostalgia, this, isn't it? It's all, it's all flashbacks to the food of yesterday. I mean, food is such an evocative memory, isn't it? From days gone by. Yeah. Or you still have cold mint sandwiches, George. Do you still... Is, is that a regular... No, I have to admit, I've never had them since the house party stopped. <laughs> he was the only person I ever heard someone once said to him about the porridge in the morning. He said, is it true you keep it in a drawer in the sideboard? And he said, yes. He made up mashes of porridge and he poured it into the bottom drawer of the sideboard and he cut a slice out and rehydrated it for you if you wanted porridge in the morning. Wow. <laughs> I recently had some rice pudding that had no milk in it and... Um... Uh, my friend does, is allergic to dairy, and uh, but had told me about this rice pudding, so I was given some rice pudding, but I had to add my own milk from the fridge separately to it, so I had to heat up the rice pudding, heat up the milk, add it together, but it was lovely, it was lovely, lovely rice pudding. Uh, uh, yeah, it was interesting. I was thinking if it was made with water, it would it would just be glue, really, wouldn't it? <laughs> Which would not be a good idea. <laughs> I, was, I was kind of thinking, it's not got milk, it's not really rice pudding, is it? Yeah, it was rice pudding without <laughs> any, yeah, yeah, it was, but it was, you know, I enjoyed it. It was good. Oh, well, that's all right. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we, we it's, it's, there's a very unusual culinary theme developing this evening, isn't there? Who knew? Uh, okay. Are we okay to go around one more time? Does that sound all right? And then I'll let you good people go and enjoy these wonderful sandwiches and desserts and things. Um, okay. I've got this one. More. This one's called I Got Nowhere Better to Be. So this seems appropriate uh, for this evening. So, yeah. <clears throat> we'll see what happens. These are all frustrated songs, really. Because I'm a frustrated songwriter and also a frustrated poet, as you can tell. <laughs> no change there, then. Anyway. Singer as well, Phil. Say again. Are you a frustrated singer as well? I'm a frustrated singer as well. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm not going to sing this one. I'll just read it. I might sing the next one though. I got nowhere better to be. It's not always easy to see you give me a rhyme and a reason to be i like the way your molecules are put together maybe you can keep me just hanging in on there's too many rules and too many systems we're trapped in a game of our very own making work hard make money get married and have a family pay tax and pay your way if you're lucky leave a legacy your words fade away sitting there forgotten. Time buries all, that which you achieve. As your descendants come and go, links in the double helix of our collective history. The universe doesn't give a damn if we're here today and gone tomorrow. Eventually all the atoms will break apart, drifting in eternal nothingness forever. We think what we do has a meaning. But it's matter that matters, of that there's no doubt. Is there an answer to life's riddle? And in the end, do we find it out? But I like the way your molecules are put together. Maybe you can keep me just hanging in on. It's not always easy to see. You give me a rhyme and a reason to be. I keep on thinking, but it seems to me that I got 
nowhere better to be. And there you are. Oh, thanks, guys. Cheers. It's Kelly now. What have you got for us? Well, I've I've just dug out one of my food poems so I could stick with the theme. <laughs> I wasn't going to read it, but it seems that that's what we're into tonight. So uh, this is about my grandfather, who was a Lithuanian Jew um, and loved food. Grandpa's food. Grandpa liked greasy food he could eat mitt fingers. Cuts requiring long, slow cooking were his favourites. Beef brisket with bay leaves and peppercorns cut into thick pink slices served with pickles. Marrow bones and turkey necks always went down well. He'd fish them from a pot of stock and suck the creamy contents noisily. He loved chicken soup with fluffy knedlach dumplings. On Friday night, it was shiny gefilte fish with onion and carrot floating in clear broth. He came from a world where people lived by toil and food was fuel for bitter, icy days. North London eateries, veganism and food allergies would have made his jaw drop to the floor. When I'm gnawing on a chicken bone or licking butter off a knife, I think of how he relished life. <laughs> he didn't have good table manners, but he loved food. <laughs> oh, this sounds wonderful. That's brilliant. Again, very evocative, so visual. Yeah. You can't keep some people from their food, can you? Yeah, we, you know, he'd, he'd be kind of nicking bits off the dish before we, we were supposed to start. <laughs> My mum used to get very cross with him. <laughs> Those are the best bits, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that, Kelly. What a lovely, lovely image. That's great. Thank you. OK, Peter, we're with you again. Oh, well. In for a penny, in for a pound and more food. Here we are. Um, I, actually, actually, you know, Kelly, uh, you know Michael Barham? Uh, he, he had a poem called The Gefilter Fish, which I still remember well. He's, he's still, he, he, I heard from him just uh, at around about Christmas time, he's still on the go, and he's, he, had, he, had, uh, he had a collection out just this year. That's right. It's a wonderful collection. Really good. And yeah, he's still going strong in his nineties, down in London now, living yeah. with his daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so, th so this one um, is uh, based around me going food shopping with the missus, uh, and among other things, it contains a list of Italian Italian grape varieties, which which um, Italian grape varieties have got great names. And it seemed to me that they had, uh, um, they, they sounded like a, a bunch of, uh, several of them together sounded like a bunch of Ostrogoth warlords. Uh, so it's called, it's called Tropic Appetites, uh, the title of which is Pinched from a Carla Blay album. Tropic Appetites. Once we were loaded the vegetable, oh, and it, it comes from a time when just after we'd lost our previous dog. So it explains the, explains the second line. Once we loaded the vegetables, milk and fruit, the cat food, past the dog food with a sigh, she marches off for her rats through the clothes and leaves me to the trolley's loose end. The CDs are nothing worth looking at. No chance of a zapper or hamel. All LCD stuff clones from the charts. And in classical, nothing with greater demands than Equato Stagione. The bookshelf shows little beyond airport novels, so I head for a browse through the spices, there to indulge tropic, tropic appetites without the jet lags or the mosquitoes. Ah, the sensual world on these shelves. Do governments know of these places? 
they should be imposing licensing hours, punitive taxes and age restrictions, lest wantonness and orgy break loose. A whole Kama Sutra could prick, prickle on lips, scent and savour with her fingers and tongue. Green caps for the herbs, all sibilance and palatal, basil and dill, rosemary, sage, sweet Sicily, like a breeze across the maquis. Spices of orange, the Sirocco's hot breath, the rumble of thunder of a coming monsoon, clack with knuckly essence, fenugreek, caraway, cardamom's cloves, turmeric, paprika, cayenne. Set on the cooking, I start to indulge. What have you been putting in this? One month is ginger with everything, grazed fingers grating nutmeg the next. I throw in more cumin to let my, gut, my, my nose guttle and the smell that unlayers it as it melts with the onions, mushrooming up from the heat. And then there's the oils. She arrives without prey, finding nothing that quite fits or suits, and the trolley one-handed. I thought you'd be here. The other lingering and hefting, which of those soft files to unbutton what treasures release. The proud-tempered Ostrogoth warlords, meanwhile, Galliopo, Garganega, Teroldego, and more, still bridle on the wine shells to come. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was brilliant. That's amazing what inspiration strikes at uh, the supermarket. <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Val, do you have another for us? Yeah. I'll read this one about climate change, since we've been talking about climate change. I've read it before. I liked it. So it's called The Flood. Did you listen? Did you listen to the wind whistle out its warning and the batter tatting of rain on your window? Did you listen to the thunder clap this morning? and the shards of rain bounce off the ground below. Did you listen when they said this was global warning and it would cause the seas and rivers to rise? Did you listen or just dismiss climate change as boring and think that it would never affect your lives? Did you listen when you heard the noise of water rushing down the street and flooding through your door? Did you listen to the environmentalists talking I think perhaps you should have listened more. Yeah, that's well said, Valley. Those are good words. And um, yeah, we do need to listen and, and uh, take action more. So yeah, send it to all the government people you can think of. Because I did go to the Climate Assembly, Citizens Assembly for Climate Change. Yeah. Years ago. And I feel like everything we've put in our report has just been totally ignored. And I don't know why we even bothered going. It's, it's quite disheartening. Yeah. Well, hopefully they'll get their act together. We'll keep on insisting. Yeah. But yeah, thank you, Val. Okay, George, have you got another one for us? Yeah, I just quickly dug out something in food. Uh, but it, it, actually, I think it comes, it comes from about the same time as the banana and bacon trifle. So uh, I think this was the, the other fad at the time was for giving you, well, hopefully this covers it. Fast food. A light chilled water to go with the plain cracker, crisply broken and placed four segments on a pale blue plate. It will be over quickly, all gone in a swallow. No calories, no nutrition. Or get the full experience, tossed from plate into bin, fast food not eaten, savoured as a concept. Uh, that's 
the the logical conclusion of nouvelle cuisine i think isn't it <laughs> the yeah. portions got smaller and smaller in the end you might as well not bother at all <laughs> always remember there was a friend of mine son and the first time that he was coming out with us and his father said yeah, I've told him that he's got to pay for the meal himself tonight. You know, his own meal, he pays for it. And he he, he saw the sweet in the menu and he ordered the sweet and it came. And it was this large plate with little drops of dew round the side and a tiny, tiny <laughs> little scoop of ice cream. I don't know where they get the ice cream scoop from. It must have been from a doll's house or something. In the middle of a little pad or something with a and it was called something like Rob Robin Hood's Delight or something and there's a sort of hmm, sugar arrow you know the brown sugar in the top of it sticking out and he said I looked at the plate and this is a young man of a you know he's a bit six foot two and he's <laughs> I, I think people just got used to eating again afterwards when they mm. got home. To <laughs> go out for a meal and then go home to actually have some dinner. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> I, I did. I mean, I'm sure you know, I, I had heard of couples that stopped off at the chippy having been at a friend's house for the meal, you know, and sort of driving home said, Jake, we should go and get fish suppers. <laughs> oh, what does that tell you? Oh, dear. Well, listen, I got I got this last one I can do here. This is the 12 Bar Blues, but I just want to thank you all for tuning in tonight. It's been great, and uh, hopefully we'll have time to uh, do the round of applause after this. But this is the 12 Bar Blues. It should be called the 11 Bar Blues because one of the bars is closed in Carlisle. See if you recognise some of these, if you know you know them. And forgive the the Bob Dylan voice. I'm going to try and get this done in the four and a half minutes. I know you said you're leaving, mulled it over down the griffin. I tried to think of a single reason, but really, I got nothing. Yeah, you, you lose. You, you, we'll cut that out in the edit. It'll be fine. You used to lose me in your eyes, sipping champagne in the spider and flies. But since you gone and left me, I keep on wondering why. Now it's me that you despise. It makes me want to scream and shout. The way you spun your little eyes well at the waterhole, yeah, I've gone to walk about. Don't know which one to choose, but with my luck I always lose. I never hear nothing but the worst kind of news. Always running into trouble, I got the twelve bar blues. Grab a quick pint in the crown, I wear my scowl and my frown. Seems I'm everybody's clown as I'm up around uptown. I went and fell into a booth. Hiding out in the king's head. All those nasty things you said made me wish that I was dead. I felt kind of lonely as I dived into the boardroom. Down to pine of cider before I skulked away into the gloom. Don't know which one to choose, but with my luck I always lose. I never hear nothing but the worst kind of news. Always running into trouble. I got the 12 bar blues. You got me thinking, honey, about all your wicked charms. I find myself at the bottom of a bottle down in the Howard Arms. Not anymore, it's closed. I'm staring at the rain through the window in open mind. Remembering how you said I treat you so unkind. You never saw it from my side. No, I think I've had enough. I didn't expect the moment of such clarity to strike me in the turf. I don't know which one to choose, but with my luck I always lose. Never hear nothing but the worst kind of news. Always running into trouble, I got the 12 bar blues. Every time I venture into Lloyd's bar, their spirits just leave me in a mess. The crowd there asks me how you are. I need to find an answer for them and me, I guess. I tried the wisdom from Woodrow Wilson, and even a plan from Roosevelt. But it seems like wherever I go, nobody knows just how it felt. 
But by the end of the evening, it's kind of inevitable, of course. I'm gonna end up singing down at the good old source. And I don't know which one to choose, but with my luck, I always lose. I never hear nothing but the worst kind of news. I'm always running into trouble. I got the 12 bar blues. Hey, well, a frustrated song from a frustrated singer. There you are. Oh, thanks very much. Cheers, guys. Thanks, we, can turn that, we can turn that into a pub crawl. I'm sure we could do that sometime. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> Thank Phil. you all for coming. Thank you all for reading. Give yourselves a round of applause, everyone who read tonight. And thanks, everyone. And for singing, everyone who listened, everyone who stayed. Very enjoyable. <laughs> it's been lovely. Thank you all for coming along. It's been been great to see you all and we'll do it again next time so remember next week we've got an in-person speakeasy at the source on the 27th and we'll do another one of these next month and it's been lovely so you take care of yourselves we'll see you again soon yeah bye, bye. bye. cheers get home safe